to hear the word of God from him. But uh, let's pray, and then we'll have Johnny come up and share the word with us. Father, thank you so much for um, bringing us here today, and thank you for Johnny and Margaret and their family. Uh, We pray continually for their transition as they see what you have in store for them next. Uh, But Lord, as for today, we want to hear from you, and so speak through Johnny using your word, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would, would you please stand as we read the word of the Lord? We're in Psalm 107, as you guys already know. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy, he's gathered out of the lands, from the east, from the west, from the north, from the south. They've wandered in the wilderness way, in a desolate way. They found no city to dwell in, hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. And then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of all their distresses. So you can be seated now. And I'd like to pray as well before we get going, if you don't mind. Father, I thank you for an opportunity to just be with family. It's a blessing here to be uh, just amongst the people of God today, familiar faces, brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, who in different ways and different facets have blessed my family over the years. And I I do just want to lift up Tim and Marilyn as they are transitioning into a new season of, of caregiving. I pray that you would just continue to strengthen them and refresh them, and and then the people of God would just surround them and undergird them and and just be the family that that we all need to be when our brothers and sisters are going through different things. We do pray for his mom. We ask, Lord, that uh, you just pour your heart upon her in a very unique and incredible way, and we ask as we are here today, Lord, opening your precious word, worshiping you, that you would so grip our hearts and uh, give us something that, that, that we can go home with and mull over and, and think about, Lord, as you've ministered to us. In your name, Jesus. Amen. As Tim said, uh, we recently have uh, transitioned uh, out, of, uh, out of pastoring in, in Longview. It was a, about a two-year process, and the Lord finally got us to a place where we, we had to let go. We believe God was doing something new. And I I don't want to go into all that, but I will give you an idea of how I ended up in Psalm 107. There's a couple of uh, portions of scripture that the Lord has been ministering to me as we have taken, I guess you could say, a sabbatical and resting and listening to the Lord. One was, of course, Psalm 23, just really ministered to me that the Lord sometimes puts us in a place where he makes us lie down and he makes us rest because he is our shepherd. He knows what's best for us, but then another one that just really has captivated me over the past uh, month and a half has been Psalm 107. Uh, I just happened to stumble upon it one morning during my devotions, and it just gripped me thinking about the goodness and the faithfulness of God, that he is always there, as we will see when we cry out to him, he always delivers. There's a common theme, as we all know, in the lives of God's people, which can be seen and read throughout the Bible. We also see it within ourselves and folks around us as well. We have a tendency as the people of God to be like the old song. It says, prone to wonder. I know a lot of us, we would like to be a different type of animal. We would like to be a shark or a bear or a grizzly bear or a lion or a panther. Nobody wants to be an ostrich. Nobody wants to be a slug. Nobody really wants to be sheep, but that's what we are. We're sheep, and sheep need a shepherd, and sheep are prone to do what? They're prone to wonder. We we find ourselves a lot of times, I think the mic dropped out because I don't sound as loud. We find ourselves a lot of time being disobedient to the Lord, getting off track, and then we have to deal with the bitter consequences of backsliding. When we come to our, maybe, Hey, you know, the Lord might really going to bless if we're already encountering this. So there you go, right? So praise God. Okay, where was I at? 
um, as sheep, we, we are prone to wander, wander away from our shepherd. And that's seen in the fact that sometimes we're disobedient to what God says in his word. And then we find ourselves in a backslidden state. We don't necessarily mean to get there, but unfortunately we find ourselves there sometimes. And then we have to deal with what? The consequences of that backslidden state from wandering away from the Lord. And usually what, what a believer will do they will come under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, and then we will get our spiritual sense about us. And what do we do? We return. We call out to the Lord. And what do we find when we do that? Does God play the cold shoulder game? Is he passive aggressive? Does he give us the business? No, he is there. He is attentive, and he cares so passionately for his people. See, there are two basic facts that emerge as we look and think about this ever-recurring cycle a lot of times within the people of God. One is we are prone to get bamboozled and we're prone to wander away from the living God, but don't overlook the facts. His mercy is absolutely inexhaustible. He cares so passionately for his people. So as we look at Psalm 107, what we see is the merciful deliverance of the Lord. And it's presented in, in four different pictures. I like pictures because I'm just kind of a simple guy. And I, I, like, I like it where it's easy to understand. And God's so good that he gives us just simple pictures to think about. First, verses 4 through 9, we see rescue for those who are lost in the wilderness. And in verses 10 through 16, we see rescue for those who are in prison. And in verses 17 to 22, recovery for those who may be seriously ill. Or verses 23 through 34, uh, 32, deliverance for the seamen in the terrible storm. Now, according to what I've read, it's possible that Psalm 107 to Psalm 119 was sung when they were going to lay the second foundation of the temple. If you remember, uh, the first temple that Solomon built was destroyed by the Babylonians under Nebuchadnezzar in 586 B.C. This was when the Jews were carried away, of course, to captivity, to Babylon, where they remained for 70 years. And then you know the rest of the story. The Lord was faithful to bring them back into their land. And so if they were singing this song, what we see is really the history of the people of Israel in regards to just how they were prone. To, how, you, well, there's one word that could describe the people of Israel. Stiff-necked. Stiff-necked. Yeah, they are people's, they are God's people, and He is passionate about His people, but they were stiff, and they were, they were just stiff-necked people. And what we see over and over again, especially in the Old Testament, is what? They get over here and God had to bring them back. He would give them the consequences and bring them back. So as we look at Psalm 107, it is a template for us today. Because I have no doubt in my mind that some of us sitting here today may be in that backslidden state and we're not happy about it. I know I've never been happy when I've been backslidden. I've been convicted by the Holy Spirit and absolutely miserable about the situation. And so as we look at these pictures and as, as I pray that the, God, uh, that the Lord would just minister to us, I, I'm really hoping that some of us today, if that's where we're at, would repent, would return, would confess sin. Now for some of us, we're not going to understand all this because maybe we are not saved. Because in order to really understand what we're looking at today, we first have to repent of our sin, accept Jesus as our Savior. And when we do that, we get the Holy Spirit, which gives us spiritual understanding of what's being shared. And so as we're making our way through this, and you're kind of scratching your head, and you kind of know where you're at in regards to your salvation, I'm going to encourage you to respond to the gospel and get saved. Now beyond all that, we're going to look at the goodness of, and the grace and just the majesty of how it, it has taken. I, I've been saved now for 25 years, and i got to be honest with you. Probably the last two years, I, I've, I've, I've come to such a better understanding of God's grace. You know, I, I grew up in a, a we're going to get to the text. I grew up in, in a home where if you made your bed, you lie in it. You, you deal with your consequences. You, 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 you know, sometimes that's just the way it is. And it's taken me a long time to come to the understanding that God doesn't think like I think. That's why Paul says what? Have the mind of who? 
have the mind of Christ because he's radically, radically different. Spurgeon said this, Ought we not look upon our own history as being at least as full of God as the lives of any of the saints who have gone before? We do our Lord injustice when we suppose that he wrought all his mighty acts and showed himself strong for those in an early time, but doeth not perform the wonders or lay bare his arm for the saints who are now upon the earth. Sickness may befall, the Lord will give grace. Poverty may happen to us, but grace will surely be afforded. Death must come, but grace will light a candle in the darkest hour. Reader, how blessed is it as the years roll round, the leaves begin to fall to enjoy such an unfading promise as this. The Lord will give grace. And that's what we're going to see this morning. Notice this. The introduction to the psalm gives the theme to the psalm. See, it says, Thanksgiving to the Lord for His great works of deliverance. See, God always saves the day. He always comes to the rescue. You can look at your own history and every time that you called out to God, did He not show up on the scene? Did He not come through in a mighty way? So let's look at verse 1. It says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord for He is good and His mercy endures forever right out the gate the introduction says the same it says give thanks he says on the beginning before we even start picking this thing apart i want you to understand one thing give thanks to the lord and he gives two good reasons why the lord is good his mercy endures forever if that's all god ever did for us would that not be more than enough if the lord all he ever done if all he ever had done for us is save us and never answered another, would that not be enough? You know, the good news of the gospel is we're saved from the wrath of God. Amen. Okay? That's good news. So right out the gate, the psalmist already has an understanding. He's dealing with people who have a past history with the living God. And he's pointing out the obvious, the obvious about the history. It's like, hey, I want to ask you a question. On the front end, before we ever get going, we're going to give thanks to God. We're going to thank Him for who He is. And who is He? He's good and His mercy endures forever. But notice the word He uses. He uses, oh, it's an exhortation stated as an exclamation. The psalmist is passionately pleading with his readers to give thanks to God for a good reason. He's good. And his mercy endures forever. And do you not read that his mercy endures forever throughout all the Psalms over and over again? I would encourage you just to underline that over and over and over again. I was recently talking with a, a friend of mine that um, we were just talking about walking with the Lord and this and that. And, and we just came to the conclusion it's not about learning, it's about unlearning. You know, I didn't get saved till I was 25, so that meant I was 25 years in the world. And now I've been 25 years into the Lord, and those 25 years have been unlearning everything I thought was right. And how, did, how does that occur? By spending time with the Lord, by being in His Word, by worshiping with the saints, by being obedient when He calls us to go forward, even when it doesn't make sense. We get to experience God. Now, the psalmist is going to get specific. Remember, he knows who he's addressing. And then he just wants to bring to remembrance of who they are. And see, this is what is crazy to me a lot of times. As Christians, we forget who we are. Who we are in God's sight. And we need to be reminded of that over and over again. Notice what he says. He says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Whom he's redeemed from the hand of the enemy and gathered out of the lands from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. See, this is a special class of people who's now singled out as particular recipients of what? The goodness, the love, namely those whom he has redeemed. Redeemed from what? persecution, slavery, oppression, trouble. They were brought back, the Jewish people from this worldwide what? Dispersion. They're brought back. They're gathered out of the lands. See, this would be a fitting statement, perhaps in the mouth of Daniel or Ezra or Nehemiah, who would have an occasion to thank God for, you came through yet again. He's a game changer. He can flip the script. He can reverse it. I think we just get so bogged down a lot of times we don't really believe it. The redeemed of the Lord. He says, these are the folks that I want to get cued in 
And these are the folks that should be thanking him for his loving kindness, for his mercy that endures forever. Now, so you see why this is not just solely for the people of Israel. It's also for us because what? We're redeemed. We're redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. Redeemed is what? Being bought back. Now think about that just for a minute. Peter says this in 1 Peter 18, 21, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by the tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without a blemish and without a spot. He indeed was foredained before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in these last times for you who through him believe in God who raised the dead and gave him glory so that your hope that your faith and hope are in God. See, we are too redeemed, so therefore we get to participate in this wonderful plan that God has. Really, what is is our... do Do we spend more time griping or praising? Now, it's easy to gripe because the flesh likes to gripe. (laughs) But are we really praising the Lord like we need to? Do we, have we forgotten who we are? That's one of the most important things that we can do tomorrow morning before we ever go out into the house. And every, I mean, every morning, we need to spend time with our Heavenly Father, our great shepherd, and let him remind us who we are in Christ. This glorious shepherd must be as thus he collects the blood-bought brought, flock from the remotest regions and guides them through countless perils. One Puritan said that. And just think of your salvation experience and how God brought each of us in from dynamically different circumstances, from the east, from the west, from the south, from the north, how he just moved and how he gathered us in. Now let's start looking at these examples. See, now we got, we got, we got, he's got our attention because we've once again been reminded who we are. But in the process of reminding us who we are, he's also going to remind us of who he is and he's going to back it up with how he's dealt with us when we found ourselves in those backslidden situations when we come to our spiritual senses and we called out to him. See, God's goodness is seen in what? His deliverance. And he gives us two examples now in verses 4 through 9. Here's the first. Deliverance for those who are lost in the wilderness. They wandered in the wilderness in a desolate way. They found no city to dwell in, hungry and thirsty. Their soul fainted in them. Fainted in them. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses, and he led them forth by the right way, that they might go into a city for a dwelling place. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he satisfies the longing soul, and he fills the hungry soul with goodness. The first picture, as most scholars believe, it points to Israel's time when they were wandering in the wilderness. And what was that like for them? Now, this is kind of interesting when you think about it. Their clothes didn't wear out. Shoes didn't wear out. They were fed every day. I mean, it just fell down from heaven, right? But what happened in the midst of all that? They got burnt out on the whole thing. The reason why they didn't go into the promised land was because of unbelief and they had to wander around until that first generation died off except for two cats, right? Joshua, Caleb. But notice what the psalmist says. He says, these people were lost. They were hungry. They were thirsty. They were disheartened. They were discouraged, right? But in the midst of that, it says, then they cried out to the Lord and suddenly their wanderings ended. The Lord led them in a direct route to the plains of Moab, then proved their jumping off place into Canaan, where they would find cities and where they could fill at home at last. But although the Israelites wandered for 40 years in the wilderness due to their unbelief, the Lord was a faithful God who led them at last to the land he had promised them all along. So too, he's a faithful God to us, leading us every step of the way and filling our longing, hungry soul with all of his goodness. But don't look at what changes, don't overlook what changes the game. Hungry, thirsty, they're so fainted. But what did they do? They cried out to the Lord and he delivered them out of all of their distresses. 
That's just how good God is. And that's how faithful He is. See, when we come to the end of ourselves and we cry out to God, he, we find that He's there all along, waiting to move us along in the right way. It's not... Is that not what happens every time when we finally just get through? Do you like wrestling? I mean, really, do you like wrestling with circumstances? I, do, I still do that. It drives me nuts. I don't know why I do that. I will wear myself out overthinking. I will outfox myself in circumstances. You know what that means? I will overthink circumstances. And you know what that does? It fatigues, it frustrates, it, it drives me nuts, it, it, it gets me so focused inward. Instead of the best thing that I could do in regards to different circumstances is what? Spend time with the Lord. I mean, he, his past faithfulness is evidence of his present faithfulness right now. He, 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 never, he never once does not come through. And so the smart thing to do is the Lord that guided me here will guide me over there. But the question is, are we at the end of ourselves? Are we really crying out to God in these, these, these pressure-type mounting situations? See, he, indeed, he will indeed lead us in the right way because why Jesus is called what? He is called the way. We read in John 14, 6, it says, Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Spurgeon said this, he says, There are many wrong ways, but only one right one, and into none can lead us but God himself. When the Lord is the leader, the way is sure to be right. We never need to question that. For at the pathless mazes of the desert, he conducted the lost ones. He found the way, made the way, enabled them to walk along in it, faint and hungry as they were, that they may go into a city of habitation. The end was a word worthy of the way. He didn't lead them from one desert to another, but he gave the wonders a bode, the weary ones a place of rest. They found no city to dwell in, but they found one readily enough. What can we do with a God that can do two very different things? It's incredible. You, we love to study the people of Israel. We really do. But we miss a lot of the examples that the people of Israel give us in regards to relationship with God. And we see His inexhaustible mercy in regards to how He takes care of His people. I want to ask you a question. Would you have signed up for Moses' gig? Really? I mean, I, personally, I think he had a pretty good gig on the back, back side of the mountain. Taking care of some sheep, you know, kind of hanging out. It all messed up when he went to that bush it didn't burn. He said, I got to go check this out. And little did he know, he says, God's going to flip the script. You know that thing that I told you 40 years ago? You know what? Now it's time to go. Because he was at that point where he went from a somebody to a nobody. Did you think that he really understood fully what he was signing up for? You like being around whiny, complaining people? They seem to just be holding you back. I, no, nobody does. But God's not like us. He doesn't get tired of us. I mean, he, he, He's so passionate. He loves His people. And all He wants us to do is call out to Him when we find ourselves in these tight spots. See, there's only one proper response when God comes through. Giving thanks to the Lord continually for His undying love, His wonderful care. But notice this. It says He satisfies the longing soul. See, I want you to understand something. There's some things that you will never be able to, to, to touch. Only God will. The place of peace, the place of comfort, the place of satisfaction. We read that he satisfies the, longly, uh, the longing soul. The psalm spoke of hungry and thirsty in the wilderness, but there's also the longing in the soul of a man. So God's literal guidance and deliverance for his redeemed in the wilderness becomes a picture of what does he do? He delivers the lost, the hungry soul with all goodness. I mean, that's what created in me this, this, this desire to repent of my sin and accept the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. I had this thing that I could not get at no matter what I did to find the satisfaction that I was looking for. Yeah, I knew I had a sin problem. But I kept trying to 
take care of the sin problem with this hobby or this thing or that thing, and the void just became bigger, and the gap between me and a holy God became bigger until finally I got to a place, there's only one way in this thing. I got to accept Jesus as my Savior. And the moment that I got saved, I can honestly tell you, I was so satisfied. For the first time in my life, I, I was content. Now, I will say that didn't last very long. <laughs> because <laughs> because then, I, then the Lord, you know, started to grow me and, and things, and he put me in spots, and, and I've learned somewhat how to rest. <laughs> Not completely. Look at the second example, deliverance for the captives. Verses 10 through 16. Those who sat in darkness in the shadow of death, bound in affliction and iron because they irons, because they rebelled against the words of God and despised the counsel of the Most High. Therefore he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down and there was none to help them. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He saved them out of all their distresses. He brought them out of darkness in the shadow of death. He broke their chains in pieces. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he's broken the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron in two. A second picture from Israel's history. It seems to concern the Babylonian captivity. The psalmist likens the 70 years of their confinement in prison. Babylon was like a dark and gloomy dungeon for these people. They were out of the promised land, right? The Israelites felt like chained prisoners condemned to this servitude. It was because of their rebellion against the words of God and their spurning of His word that they were sent off into exile. Because they continually rebelled against the Lord and instead immersed themselves in what? Idol worship. Israel was carried away captive. Crushed and beaten by hard labor, they fell down under the load and no one took sides with them. Now, we read in verse 16, and we're going to get back to um, the verses before that, but it says, For he's broken the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron in two. This is the verse that leads us to believe that the psalmist is, of course, referring to the Babylonian captivity. Because in Isaiah 45, 2, it says, where the Lord used almost the identical words to describe the way in which he had bring the exile, their exile to a close, speaking of Cyrus. He would go before you and make the crooked places straight. He would break the pieces in the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron. See, there's circumstance. It was not going to change until God changed it. Okay? Um, I, vocationally, I was a machinist for roughly 25 years. And I cut a bunch of different metals. Aluminum's fun to cut. Stainless 303's fun to cut. Um, stress steel is fun to cut. Now, I'm losing a lot of people on these, 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 these examples. But I will tell you this. Bronze is not necessarily fun to cut. It, it's kind of a hard metal. It, 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 it's, just, it's just not fun. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't necessarily uh, chip off and, and bring these great chips. It's, it's kind of a, it's, kind of, it's, it's just not fun, but it's a very hard, it's a very tough metal, and it's just not very fun. And so immediately when I think of these bronze gates, I think about how, how God has given this picture of how, how much he shut them in, and there was nothing, absolutely nothing they could do in their own strength to, to get out of that circumstance until they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. And he saved them out of all their distresses. And this was done by bringing them out of darkness and the shadow of death, removing their bonds from them when they cried out to the Lord. He brought them in. Now, what does that say to us? Well, the same thing happens to us when we don't do what the Lord says, first of all. We'll find ourselves enslaved by our own foolish sins and our own carnal lust. We'll plunge into that which we think we're free to do, only to find the very thing that we may think we're free to do will trap us in. But when we cry out to the Lord, He hears us and He sets us free. The Lord will break the strongest gates and bars when the time comes to set prisoners free and set prisoners loose. Spiritually, the Lord Jesus has broken the most powerful spiritual bonds and made us free indeed. Man, why wouldn't we praise Him more? Seriously. You know praise changes the atmosphere of everything? Just like negativity and criticalness changes the atmosphere. Praise, 
thankfulness. And we have reason to be thankful because God's already come through when we responded to the gospel. We were set free. Some of my favorite portions of Scripture is a chapter in Romans 8 when it talks about God and it talks about how He's so for His people. We read that, What shall we say then to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all, how shall He not with Him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It's God who justifies. Who is He who condemns? It is Christ who died, furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril of the sword? Why are we not calling out to Him? Why? I, I, we, we, a lot of times when, when a per, this is what I've seen, a lot of times when someone is backslidden, they think God does not want to be around them. The enemy lies to them. When instead, that's not God at all. God's wanting them to return. God is wanting them to be. That's why he allows circumstances sometimes to do what? It pushes us, it hems us in where we only have one place to go. Now, we only have one place to go every time, okay? We only have one place to go. But sometimes we need that reminder that, you know what, I'm not getting out of this thing because this is barns of iron. I can't escape it. God's got to come through and God's got to move. So why are we not praising him? I mean, really, we get the opportunity to come to church on Sunday to celebrate a work that's already been done. That's why we're here. And we get to open His Word, and what we do, we get to learn about who He is. And the more we learn about who He is, that transforms us, it changes us, and it gives us this heavenly perspective over circumstances. Because He's a game changer. Next two examples, 17 through 32, the sick soul and those who are caught in the storm. Look at verse 17 through 22. The sick soul. Fools, because of their transgressions, because of their iniquities, were afflicted. Their soul had poured all manner of food. They drew near to the gates of death. They cried out to the Lord in their trouble. He saved them out of all their distresses. He sent His word and healed them and delivered them from all their destructions. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for His goodness and for His wonderful works to the children of men. Let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare the works with rejoicing. Notice this. Fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities were afflicted. Now historically, I really, there's a lot of different things that some folks point to in regards to the people of Israel and, and, and maybe what the psalmist is getting at. I didn't really want to delve into that, to be honest with you. But, but I would point this out. Would you not agree they were kind of foolish a lot of times? Just look at Judges. <laughs> Everybody did what? Well, what's the theme of the book of Judges? Everybody was doing what was right and what? Man, you guys are taught really well. You need to give him a raise. I'm trying to help you out. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> a fool acts as if there is no God. I'm so kidding with that, by the way. Uh, I'm so kidding with that. A fool acts as if there is no God, right? And how did people of Israel act after that first generation kind of died off? <coughs> They just did what was right in their own eyes. They acted like there was no God at all. Then you get over to you get over to what? You get over to first kings, you get over to second kings, and you just see this this whole theme. You're you're acting like you're 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 not the people of God. What did God warn them going into the promised land? Not to mess with what? He says, I'm about to bless you. You're going to get homes, you're going to get vineyards, you're going to get wells, you're going to get all this stuff, but you will be in such a place of blessing that, guess what? You're going to forget me. Write it on the doorpost. Remind your children. You're not worshiping in groves. That's not where you're worshiping. Why? Because that's where idol worships worshiped. He warned them. And imagine, 
Imagine this. How foolish is it that you know that you know that you know the only reason the house you're in, the only reason you got the vineyard you got, the only reason you got the well that you got, the only reason you got the land that you got, is because your God gave it to you. And then you act like you don't even know Him. It's foolish. Even though their trouble could be traced to their foolishness, transgression and iniquity, they drew near to the gates of death. The psalmist described they were sick and near death. They had no appetite. Their soul poured all manner of food and they wasted away. Are you really hungry when your circumstances stink? (laughs) Are you really hungry when your circumstances stink and you're the reason why your circumstances stink? That's where they were at. But notice this. This is where God's at. It says, again, they were distressed. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble. And as usual, he did what? He saved them. This time salvation came as he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. See, man is not always healed by the skill of a doctor or a surgeon. He's sometimes healed by the simple word of the Lord. And how does the Lord save his people out of their distresses? Sometimes it's not mystically or miraculously. No, sometimes it's simply a word from him. How many times have you been down and out and you opened your Bible and God gave you exactly what you needed? He gave you fresh manna from his word for today and it gave you enough strength to continue on. How many times have you been beat down, wore out, And God said, no, I want you to understand something. This is who you are in Christ according to what my word says. And it transfixed us and it changed us. That's why the ministry of the word is absolutely so wonderful. You you guys are, I I love Tim. I've known him uh, in Maryland for now, I guess, 12 years. 12, it's hard to believe, isn't it? And, And I love him. I call him the professor. And you're blessed to have people that that love the word and care that you guys get a a good meal every time you come here. Because God has an understanding. What does his people need at the end of the day? He needs his, that people need his word. That's it. What good is it to to tell a cute, funny story? You might laugh for about five minutes, but it's going to help us as we go out and have to deal with reality. Cheerleading only works for just a little bit. But when we are given a word from the Lord and the Holy Spirit just totally confirms that thing, that is such a game changer. You know why? Because we know that, that, that the God in heaven who is seated on his throne, he cares so passionately about his people. It's like, I know where you're at. I know what you're going through. Here, I got something for you. We read in John 10, 27, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me. What about Psalm 1, verse 1 through 3? Blessed is the man who walks in the count who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and his law he meditates night and day. And he shall be like a tree planted by rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. A word from the Lord. Twice before, it's repeated again. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness for his wonderful works to the children of man. A man rescued from disease, whether physical or spiritual, has no choice but to praise and thank God for his deliverance. I want to ask you a question. How willing, willingly are we to pay hospitals for care? how much more willing are we, or should we be in giving praise to God? Because for those who are in Christ, everybody will eventually be healed. We get a glorified... I mean, think about it. I, I know, am I going too long? It's been about a month now, so I got a lot stored up. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm not going to be here that long. Maybe, no, I don't know. Think about it this way. Think about this. If you, 
Let's, let's take your checking book, your assets. Let's say someone came to you and said, hey, I, I got a deal for you. I'm going to trade you Bill Gates stuff for your stuff. Now, I don't think that's a good thing for a lot of people. How many people are going to turn that down, though? Now, I've got another proposition for you, another thought. I come to you and I say, hey, guess what? You can be clean. You can have a clear conscience. You can get a new glorified body one day. You can live forever. The person's going to be saying, how? Well, I got this message, this gospel message, this good news of the Lord Jesus Christ that I want to share with you. Repent of your sin, accept Jesus as your Savior, and all this can be yours free of charge. How many people turn that down? Now, granted, true salvations take place from the conviction of the Holy Spirit, not common sense. But nonetheless, does it not put in perspective what we have attained because of our Lord Jesus Christ? Once again, I'm getting back to the, I'm getting back to the theme, man. The theme is thankfulness because He's good. Because His mercy endures forever. We've already experienced it. We've already been healed by the blood of Christ. Now what about for those in a storm? He gives us another example. Who's in a storm? Smooth sailing. It's going to get rough before long. No, I'm kidding. But who's been in a storm? That's a better one. Everybody's been in a storm, right? Everybody's been in a storm. It says, those who go down to the, uh, to the sea in ships who do business on great waters, they see the works of the Lord and they wonders in the deep. For he commands and raises the stormy wind, which lifts up the waves of the sea and they mount up the heavens. They go down against the depths. Their soul melts because of trouble. They reel to and fro, staggered like a drunken man. They're at their wits end. They cry out to the Lord in their trouble and he brings them out of their distresses. He calms the storm so the waves are still. Then they are glad because they are quiet so he guides them to their desired haven. Oh that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Let them exalt him also in the assembly of the people and praise him in the company of the elders. The last picture is really more graphic. It's about those who traverse the sea in ocean going ships. They know something of the power of the Lord because they experience storms on the sea. Now, I personally have never really traveled on the sea. I'm just an East Texas country boy who's hit every crawdad hole around here fishing. I mean, that's the extent. But I will tell you this, if you're in a low-profile bass boat on the lake when one of these East Texas storms blow up, that is the last place you want to be, especially when your motor will not crank. <laughs> or wait, start. <laughs> So you can imagine the, the power of the ocean and the size of the waves and the magnitude of different things that these type of... And you think of the vessels during this time period that these guys were traversing the sea in. They're not like vessels today. And you can imagine what it was like. We have a, 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 an, a, an example out of the book of Acts. Remember Paul? He said, hey, don't go. Let's hang out here. Uh, what do you know, Paul? You don't know anything. I've traveled the seas. What happened? They almost lost everything. But Paul said, hey, don't throw it. Don't, don't throw it. Don't let anybody die. You know, remember the whole story? God got them to where they were going to go. What about Jesus telling the disciples to get into the boat? Remember that one? And he was up there praying. And eventually, what did he do? He walked on water to there. Now, now you start getting these images of what that must have been like. I, you know, these waves are going, I mean, Jesus walking up the wave, going down the wave. I mean, I don't know what that looks like. Or what about the time he was asleep in the stern of the boat? It was a, here's my point. In each of those instances, and these are instances from the Bible, the guys were freaked out because there was nothing that they could do to contend with waves and storm because the, the, the extent of their experience did not help them. 
Okay? It was a scary situation. They were going to lose their life. It says they were at their wit's end, meaning they had come to the end of themselves and their own resources and what they could do. They were totally helpless. All their skills at navigation were ineffective so that they became desperate. Could you not say that Israel has been in one storm after another? They're in a storm right now that they really can't do anything about it. They're not going to get kicked out of their land. But nonetheless, there, there are dominoes falling. There are things happening because history is his story. It's God's story. Now think about this from just our perspective. Uh, who likes really going through storms? I'm not talking literal storms. I'm, I'm, I'm talking circumstances and things that just kind of come upon us. Now, some storms are brought by our disobedience, and they're storms of correction. Other storms, God just allows to just grow us a bit. And normally when we find ourselves in storms, what do we do? We, we rely on our own navigation skills. We rely upon maybe our vessel. We rely upon ourselves. And unfortunately, you might be like me. You have to get to your wits end <laughs> before you really realize, okay, there's only one person that can handle the situation that I'm in, and it's the person that's always handled the situations that I've been in. It's Jesus. Peter said, hey, if that's you, I want to come to you. And Jesus says, come on. And Peter was walking on water till what? He took his eyes off, and then he sunk like a rock. What about Jesus when he was asleep in the, at, 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 the, at the front of the boat? The disciples are like, do you, not give her, do you not care what's going on here? And what is Jesus? I mean, Jesus wakes up, you know, be still, and all of a sudden, you know, and things like that. See, some storms, there is nothing we can do but ride them out. But we need to remember who's in the boat with us. Jesus. You know, um, I guess it was Friday night. We had a bad storm come through where I live. I live around Hallsville. And, um, you know, we stayed up. Before, now before, uh, when I was a single guy, I lived in a trailer house out in the middle of nowhere. And I just batten down the hatches and go to sleep. You know, whatever happens going to happen. Uh, but now that I have, you know, a wife and have two kids, I'm like, man, you know, I want to kind of be attentive. What if a tornado's come? What are we going to do, you know? And so we, we basically set up and we just rode the storm out waiting. Some of us in here are in a storm and circumstances are kind of unfavorable and maybe we're a little wore out. And, and my encouragement to you is God can change it. He, he can change it. And it is only seasonal. It will eventually pass. But in the midst of that, God promises something for us in the midst of a storm. He promises peace. That's what he promises. Now here's something that's going to really, I, I, I think, should be a game changer in regards to when we come together and we're worshiping the Lord on Sunday morning. It says, let them exalt him also in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Because before that, it says, when they cried out to the Lord, he got them to their desired haven. In other words, he got them to that safe place, right? He did a work in their life. So here's the thing. When the Lord does a work in your life, Monday to Wednesday, Wednesday to Sunday, you know what would be like super encouraging? Praise Him amongst the elders. Praise Him amongst the people of God. Give testimony to what God is doing. Now, I'm not talking humble bragging or one-upping because you can tell, you can tell that. What I'm talking about is, hey, I want to tell you how good God's been to me. 
But you can't tell people how good God's been to you unless you're kind of honest about what's really going on. <laughs> Did you ever think about that? I guarantee you, every week, there's an opportunity to respond. That means, I, I don't know, how, how do you, do you have people in the back or you have people come forward? and You just pray. An opportunity to respond and have people pray, have the people of God to come around and pray about the situation, about the circumstance. There's no such thing as a lone wolf Christian. We're described as what? The, the flock of God. And so when we're going through stuff and we're sharing with the body of what we're going through and asking for prayer, when God comes through and we get to talk about how God came through, you know what an encouragement that is to the family of God? It's like, wow, God's moving, God's working. He's always moving, He's always working. I just don't think the people of God are really talking about it. What about after service coming up to Tim and saying, you know what, the Lord really blessed me and how He used you today. I'm so thankful. Not that you're, you're trying to puff, puff, you know, pump him up, but God just really, I mean, man, that, that I needed to hear that today. That would be so encouraging for him. I guarantee you. Because it is always encouraging for me that we're actually talking about the things of God because we are experiencing this wonderful and holy and magnificent God. It may just be the fact that I am so thankful that I'm saved. <laughs> that would be more than enough. Now let's put all this stuff together. See, folks, the God we serve is in complete control. He can reverse things. He changes things. He's a game changer, right? So we read in verses 33 through 38, He turns rivers into a wilderness, a water spring into dry ground, fruitful land into barrenness for the wickedness of those who dwell in it. He turns the wilderness into pools of water, dry land into water springs. There He makes the hungry dwell that they may establish a city for a dwelling place, sow fields and plant vineyards that they may yield a fruitful harvest. He also blesses them and they multiply greatly and He does not let their cattle decrease. Now, indeed, if this was one of the psalms that were sung during the laying of the, the, the foundation of the second temple, think about what it actually looked like there. They've been gone. Have you ever seen an old home place where people have been gone? It's grown up. It's kind of run down. It looks like ain't nobody been around, right? So all this is going on, and as they're looking around, it could have been... It could have been something like this, couldn't it? Let them exalt him in the assembly of the people and praise him in the company of the elders because he turns rivers into wilderness, water springs into dry ground, fruitful land into barrenness for the wickedness of those who dwell in it. Looking around, these folks, when they return, they could have seen, wow. And they could have been overwhelmed. And they could have been bummed out. But see, here's the thing. God can turn things around because he's a game changer. We read in verses 35 through 38, He turns a wilderness in pools of water, dry land into water springs. There makes a hungry dwell there that, that they may establish a city for a dwelling place and sow fields to plant vineyards that they may yield a fruitful harvest. He also blesses them and multiply, multi, multiply greatly and He does not let their cattle decrease. See, God can restore favor to a nation, to a person because you know what? He can change things. He can multiply things. He can bless. He can flip the script. Is that not what happened when we got saved? Same God today. Now granted, I do have an understanding that some circumstances may not change. But we can change in regards to how we relate to our circumstances because of who God is. He's still God. He can give us peace. He can give us comfort. And that too is encouraging to those around us who see we're going through a hard time. That too is seeing fruit. Okay? Because I think enough of us have, uh, 
Most of us have lived long enough to understand that we live in a fallen world. And if you are following the Lord, you are swimming against the current. And don't think that it's just going to be a cakewalk. Was it easy for Daniel? No. David? No. Moses? No. Paul? No. Peter? No. What about Joseph? No. Abraham? No. Jesus? No. But I have seen God flip the script on circumstances. <laughs> because he can if that is his will, and if it is definitely for his glory. But a lot of times what God does in multiplying and fruitfulness for his glory is he equips us with his peace and with his comfort, and we're such a blessing to those around us. I like this. God has the final say-so. Some of us in here think our boss has the final say-so. Some of us in here think the government has the final say-so. We may have some situation in our life that we think is the final say-so. God has the final say-so. It says, When they are diminished and brought low, though through oppression, affliction, and sorrow, he pours contempt on princes and causes them to wander in the wilderness where there is no way. He says he pours contempt on princes. See, in the same way that God can turn rivers into dry wildernesses, he can take princes of the world and bring them low and cause those guys to wander in the wilderness. This is especially true of the rulers who were... Uh, think about this. Think about this. Rulers who subject God's people to oppression, affliction, and sorrow. I guarantee you Pharaoh never... He thought he was absolutely untouchable, didn't he? What about Herod? Think about this for a moment. What about Hitler? Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit, a fall. It does not matter who you are. God shows no partiality. He has the final say so. See, here's the truth of the matter, the key to any reversal. And it's found in just one word. And everybody knows it. Repent. That's the key. If you're traveling on the interstate and you miss your turn, you miss your exit, and the exit is where you need to go to get where you want to go, do you keep on traveling down the interstate? <laughs> How do you get to where you need to go where you know you want to go? You got to take what? The next off-ramp that's going to go over the interstate that's going to come back up the service road, and then you're going to have to do what? You're going to have to go above that a little bit further, and then you come back down to get off the correct what? What's that called again? I done forgot. See, I just drive down farm and market roads. Off-ramp, thank you. Well-traveled man. <laughs> but what do you have to do? You've got to turn it around, right? The key to your reversal is what? Turning around. And so the key to any type of reversal is what the psalmist has already been saying through the whole thing. Crying out to God. Notice what he says. He sets the poor on high from affliction and makes their families like a flock. See, the working of God's provincial care is seen. Whether one is a prince or maybe one is of a lower standard, that is never the issue. The issue is whether they are repentant before God. Though we may be poor... If we live righteously and faithfully for God, we shall prosper. And not only this, the righteous shall see it, and they shall rejoice. Now, prospering does not mean that all of a sudden we're going to have a large bank account. I want to, I want to get that out there. Prospering means that, you know what? We're just blessed. How God sees fit to bless us. Blessed in maturity. Blessed maybe in health. Blessed in marriage. I, you know, I don't know what that completely may look like. Now, He may bless us financially. But would you not say following the Lord? We're blessed by the Lord and we're prospered in those things. And notice this, iniquity shall stop her mouth. 
See, it's a tremendous thing when divine providence so rules in the affairs of men that you know what? It silences the blasphemies of the evil. Why debate? Why not just live and follow after heart after the Lord and let, 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 let our light shine before men so they may you know, see our good, wo- good works and, and give praise unto Him? The point's simple in taking a look at all these things that they will understand the loving kindness of the Lord, His loyal love, His covenant love of God by which the statements promises in His word but we also understand it by how he acts among all men in history. And if we have wisdom to see it, then you know what? We appropriate that and act accordingly. You want to shut up the blasphemers? Follow hard after God. Now let's tie this stuff up, and I did go longer than I wanted to, so I'm sorry for for that. This morning, maybe we are one of these folks mentioned in this song. Maybe. Maybe. In verses 4 through 9, maybe we're that that person that's wandering around in the wilderness needing direction, needing a guide. In verses 10 through 16, we may be those who are captive or in prison who needs a deliverer. In verses 17 through 22, maybe we're sick of soul and we need a healing, we need a physician. In verses 23 through 30, we see the storm-tossed sailor and maybe what we need is some calm waters. We need a haven to pour it in. Now, how did all these folks find what they needed? By calling out to the Lord. We read time and time again, they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and He delivered them out of all their distresses. And what did they learn? They learned what? They learned the loving kindness of the Lord. And is that not what we see when we see Jesus? (laughs) I had a, a pastor tell me, if you feel dead, read the red. I like that. It stuck with me. I thought it was goofy at first, but you know what? I got to thinking about it. Yeah, read the words of Jesus. Now, I understand this is all God's Word. I get that. <laughs> but spend times in the Gospels. Spend times in the Gospels. Did I just say that? I'm sorry. Spend time in the Gospels. Looking at Jesus, the author, the author and finisher of our faith. Spend time looking at Him and how He interacted with people what he was concerned with. Because Jesus said, if you see me, you've seen who? You've seen the Father. Now let's listen to this. Listen to this just for a minute. See, in each of these four scenarios, verses 4 through 30, Jesus is always the answer. For those that wander around and need a guide in the wilderness, Jesus does what? He says, I am the way. When we don't know what to do or where to go, just spend time with the Lord. Stay close to Him and we will end up exactly where we should be. Jesus is also a deliverer for the prisoner. We read in Luke's Gospel in chapter 4 verse 18, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He's anointed me to preach the Gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the broken hearty hearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and the recovery of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Proclaim liberty to the captives. What about this one? Jesus is the great physician for the sick of body or the soul. Yes, he heals, but he even does more than that itself. What does Jesus say that he gives us? Life. Life. He says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. What about this? Jesus calms the storm as well. He is our peace. No matter what we're going through, He is our peace. Now at any given time, He can say, be still, done, over. He can. But I found time and time again, the storm comes because God's trying to get something And he's stretching me a little bit and he's growing me. And a lot of times all he's really wanting to do is develop more intimacy with me. That's it. We read in John 16, 33, Jesus said this. He says, these things I've spoken to you that in me you may have peace in the world. Okay, Jesus said this. (laughs) You will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. 
See, it's not about what we need, but it's about who we need. And who we need is Jesus. Because He's a game changer. But He can't change your game if you've never responded to the gospel. I can remember getting saved. And, and I am going to close, I promise. I can remember getting saved. He hemmed my circumstances in. I knew I needed to get saved. I kind of rationalized in my mind, well, I'm not doing this, I'm not doing that, this person's doing this, this person's doing that. I, 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 you know, I pay my taxes, I show up for work, I don't cuss that much. I mean, I could go on and on and on about what I didn't do and who I thought I was, but at the end of the day, I knew I had a sin problem. And I knew, in my spirit, my sin separated me from a holy God. And I finally got to that place where I'm like, okay, Lord, I confess my sin. Repented. I need you to be my Savior. Now, I didn't completely understand that. Okay? But I was convicted by the Holy Spirit. And I knew that what I needed to do. And from that moment on, He has been such a game changer in my life because I've not been left to my own resources. I may try to tap into my own resources and they are very limited. But at the end of the day, I know time and time again, all I got to do is cry out to him. And those circumstances may not change. He will come in and he will settle in and I know that he's my God, he's my shepherd and he will, he will finish what he started. But it all starts with responding to the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because this psalm was written to who? Now everybody experiences God's goodness. I want us to get this. Because he sends rain on what? The evil and the good. If he doesn't send no rain, nobody eating. But this psalm right here was written to folks. He said straight out, straight out the gate. You need to be thankful and start praising him right now. Because you're redeemed. If you're sitting outside of that not redeemed part, it's hard to, to, to be part of this praising part. Because you only praise somebody for what they've done, right? Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Do you want to close? Um, it's an opportunity every time we, we come together to worship the Lord, to enjoy the Lord. Uh, to allow the Holy Spirit to, to move. And I'm, I'm sure that's what happens here on a regular basis. The guys are going to be leading us in worship. And my encouragement to all of us, and us, I said us, me too, is if the Lord has, has put something on your heart, I encourage you to come talk to your pastor or, or one of the, the elders that you guys have here. You just... Allow the Lord to, to move. Don't, don't put it off. Okay? It's been wonderful being with you guys this morning, by the way. God bless you. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for just an opportunity. Uh, I pray, Father, that um, all of us would remember that you are always there, that you care so greatly for us. And when we cry out to you, you hear us. You say in Hebrews, Lord, that, that we will find mercy and grace every time. That we're to, to, to come boldly to this great throne of grace. And so, Lord, I'm just asking you would move in a, in a mighty way and just bless my brothers and sisters in you. In your name, Jesus. Amen.